Hello everybody, this is iCreator and welcome to this video on electricity generation. Are you buying electric energy? Most likely yes, as electricity is one of the key components of our modern civilization and our high standard of living. We use it for heating and cooling of buildings, water heating, refrigeration and household appliances, lighting, all computation and communication devices, machines and tools in the manufacturing plants and also partly public transport. Electricity generation is in the spotlight of current global developments, and this is due to three megatrends. First, the world's population strives for a higher standard of living, which requires more electricity at low cost. Worldwide electricity generation is constantly increasing, reaching more than 25,000 terawatt hour annually. Second, it is on the way to become more environmentally friendly and sustainable. The main focus here is on CO2 emissions. This can only be achieved by changing the way how electricity is produced. And finally, electrification. Motivated by various reasons like cost, performance and CO2 emissions, we see technology shifts happening in many applications, away from burning of fuel to the use of even more electricity as an energy source. The stepwise electrification of the transportation sector is just one example. Where are we standing today in different parts of the world? And how can these trends be fulfilled in the future? In this video, we want to look systematically at the principles of electricity generation. We will go through all different methods and look at their technical and economic boundary conditions. We will check out examples of power plants and electricity companies all over the world. Which one do you think has the lowest production cost and why? Natural gas power plants in Russia? hydropower in China, nuclear power in Canada, or maybe geothermal power in the Philippines. As this field is highly dynamic and the situation is very much different in different parts of the world, we want to especially focus also on the evaluation methodology and provide you with some simple calculators for your own use. They certainly are not detailed enough for your next investment decision into a power plant, but they will help you to further study the fascinating field of electricity generation and put whatever you watch or read as announcements into perspective. At the beginning, some very basic theory. Do you have a good answer to the shocking question, what is electricity? If you wish, you can pause the video for a moment and see what definition you have in mind. We would say electricity is everything related to the forces between electric charges, their resulting movements and the resulting energy. Let's start with the forces. They are described by Coulomb's law. Positive and negative charges are attracting each other, whereas positive and positive and negative and negative are repulsing each other. The basic particles that carry an electric charge are the proton and the electron both having the same quantity of 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulomb, with the proton being positive and the electron being negative. One coulomb is the unit of electric charge. If we look around in nature, we rarely see electric forces being in action a lot, if you compare it, for example, to gravity. And this is simply because gravity is always attractive and electric forces are attractive and repulsive so they are mostly cancelling out each other. Simply spoken, the negatively charged particles seek positively charged neighbors and vice versa. So the sum of all electric forces, which is also called the electric field, is mostly zero. Now let's look at a situation where we have separated charges, like in this scheme here, where we have two metal plates one carries an electric charge of plus Q1 and the other one of minus Q1. Here we can define an electric potential VE. This is the energy needed to bring a unit of electric charge from a reference point to a specific point in an electric field. If you want to bring a positive charge onto this plate here, we will have to use energy since we have to work against the repulsive force. On the other hand, if we want to bring it to the other plate, then we can gain energy, since our positive test charge is attracted by this negatively charged plate. 
So the electric potential of this plate here and this plate here is different. And the difference in electric potential between two points is called voltage, with the unit being one volt. It is basically the energy that is needed to bring a unit of electric charge from point 1 to point 2. We can now connect both plates with a conductor and bring a certain amount of charge Q from here to here. If the voltage is the energy per charge, this means that if we multiply the voltage with the charge Q, we get the total energy that is needed or gained to do that. This is meant with electric energy and the unit is 1 coulomb times 1 volt, which is called 1 joule. The electric power is basically the speed with which this energy transfer happens. So energy divided by time. The unit is 1 joule per second, which is called 1 watt. And this also means that the unit of electric energy, 1 joule, is 1 watt times 1 second. In this video we will be confronted with a broad span of power values. So additionally to watt, we will use the units with the prefixes kilowatt, megawatt, gigawatt and terawatt back and forth. Here are some examples to give you a better feeling for typical quantities of electric power. On the electric energy side, usually the unit joule or watt seconds are not utilized, but rather watt hours. An hour has 3600 seconds. And then of course the terms kilowatt hour, megawatt hour, gigawatt hour and terawatt hour are the common units. And also here you can find some examples for typical quantities. Just a side remark, you might notice that for example in the press quite often you can find the terms power, energy, watt and watt hour being mixed up. So please keep the difference in mind. So now the big question, how to generate electricity? In order to do that, we need an engineering solution for a device that performs two basic steps at the same time. First, utilize some form of input work to induce a separation of electric charges to generate a voltage. And second, let the electric charges recombine through an electric circuit that enables connected electric devices to generate a desired work. This is schematically shown here. We will see in a moment which types of input work are suitable to power electricity generators and how they actually work. But before doing that, let's look into a few important details. First, some generators produce direct current with the electrons are basically flowing always in the same direction. Others are producing alternating current, so the flow direction is switching with a defined frequency which is commonly 50 or 60 Hz. The same holds true for the electric devices, some of them work with direct current, others with alternating current. But with the help of converters, in principle all electric devices can be powered by any type of electricity generator. Second, transformations between different types of energy are usually not 100% perfect. In both devices there are losses, which are basically a proportion of undesired work, usually thermal energy. So the generated desired output work will be lower than the input work. In this video we will especially look at the losses on the side of the generator as they are affecting the electricity production cost. As we will see later, some of these losses can be minimized by improved engineering and R&D, others cannot be avoided due to the underlying physics. In the real world we usually have an electrical grid in which many generators are connected to many electric devices. Here we have a simple example of six light bulbs connected to one generator. In principle, in the grid there is no storage of energy happening. This means at all times the amount of work going into the system must be equal to the amount of work going out of the system. Both processes really happen at the same time. So for example, if you turn off half of the light bulbs, then suddenly the other half would get twice the power which is most likely more than they are designed for. In order to deal with the situation, the electricity generator 
needs to be able to follow the demand and should ideally reduce its production by 50% immediately. Therefore, the speed with which electricity generators can be ramped up and down is an important property as well. Another interesting point, the electric cables in the system can be quite long in practice, like hundreds of kilometers. And this is pretty unique to electricity as also being a method of transportation of energy. It has many practical advantages if the locations where the energy is utilized and where it's originally being generated can be far away. So let's go one step further. Which principal methods exist to achieve step one? There are actually not so many different effects that can be used to induce a separation of electric charges. The main categories are electromagnetic induction, the photovoltaic effect, electrochemical potential differences, the thermoelectric effect and the piezoelectric effect. The electromagnetic induction is by far the most common effect that is used for the electricity generation and the device that it used to perform this task is simply called an electric generator. How does it work? Basically, a rotating magnet is producing a changing magnetic field and this is inducing an electric current in a coil. The coil is connected to the grid so the electric circuit is closed and the current can be used to power some devices. So how about the input energy? According to Lenz's law, the current induced in the coil is also creating a magnetic field and this magnetic field is then pulling on the magnet. So one has to constantly apply mechanical rotational energy to keep the magnet going. So this translates the question of electricity production further to how we can generate rotational mechanical energy. There are two basic devices used, the turbine and the combustion engine. Almost all power plants are using turbines, so let's have a look how a turbine can in principle be powered and where the necessary energy is coming from. The first possibility is by the use of gravity as a force. The most common implementation uses water as a medium and the gravitational force of Earth, which is the basis of hydropower plants. A second implementation is also using water as the medium, but the gravitational force of the Moon and the Sun, which lead to tides and can be utilized in tidal power plants. The second big source of driving forces are pressure differences in gases, this leads to directed movement of the gas molecules which can be used to power a turbine. There are a few ways how this principle is technically utilized. Natural pressure differences in the atmosphere result in wind and can power wind turbines. Here the medium is air. Another way of creating a pressure difference is to burn natural gas in corresponding gas power plants. And another medium that is commonly used is water that is evaporated in the form of steam. Heating and evaporating water requires thermal energy, so at the end the question is how one can create thermal energy. Here a whole zoo of possibilities exist, most of them are related to the chemical oxidation of some sort of fuel, which can be coal, oil, waste or biomass. But one can also use sunlight in a solar thermal power plant or the heat of the earth in geothermal power plants. Another way to generate heat is via nuclear transformations, of which nuclear fission is very commonly applied since many years, while the nuclear fusion power is still in the development stage, with many technical and practical problems still to be solved. The use of combustion engine rather than a turbine is popular only for smaller power plants, for example in combination with a biogas generation unit. We have seen that almost all methods of electricity generation are at the end based on the effect of electromagnetic induction. The second effect that is widely used nowadays is the photovoltaic effect, with the device being a photovoltaic cell that transforms the energy of light into electric energy. The only relevant light source is of course the sun. Using electrochemical potential differences in an electrochemical cell is basically using energy of a chemical reaction as the driving force. Here we are in the regime of various types of batteries and fuel cells as possible implementations. Another possibility are thermoelectric generators that are converting heat flux into electric energy. Besides some uses for remote electricity generation, 
An interesting source of heat flux is the waste heat of industrial processes or machines that potentially comes at zero cost. Finally, we have the piezoelectric generator that converts mechanical stress into electricity. However, this technology is not known for controlled electricity generation, but rather for the generation of sparks that are used to ignite gas in a lighter. In this video, we will focus only on those technologies that are currently used for large-scale electricity generation to power the grid. Others, for example the very important field of energy storage by electrochemical cells, will be the topic of upcoming videos. Now, what are the key properties of electric power plants? In this video, we will look at regional availability, as not every type of power plant works very well in every place on Earth. Temporal availability, some types of power plants have a fluctuating output. Land use, impacts and risks related to the environment and to health, mainly the people living in the vicinity of the power plants. And finally, of course, the economics, which is the cost of the electricity produced, but also including ancillary services that come with some of the technologies. Let's look a little bit deeper into cost calculations. The basic question is, for a given power plant, how much energy does it produce per year and what are the total annual costs of the power plant? If you know both, you can calculate its electricity production cost. The two key metrics for every power plant are the maximum power output, also called nameplate capacity, and the total annual energy produced. Since a year has 8760 hours, this means that the maximum annual energy production for a 1 kilowatt of nameplate capacity would be 8760 kilowatt hour. As we will see later, this maximum is not reached for various reasons. If, for example, only half of the maximum is produced, which is 4380 kilowatt hours, one would say that the plant runs at 50% capacity. An alternative way to express this would be the plant is running at 4380 annual full load hours, which formally means that the annual energy produced corresponds to the value of running the plant 4380 hours on full power and 4380 hours on zero power. Of course, power plants are not running at full power or zero power only, and power output can usually vary within a wide range. But for cost calculations and comparisons of different power plants, the concept of annual full load hours is quite common. For calculating the annual cost of power plants, in this video we are using the approach of a simplified annual profit and loss statement. In the literature you will commonly find the levelized cost of electricity, or LCOE, which basically takes into account the discounted cash flows of the power plants over their whole lifetime. This metric is very useful for investment decisions, but requires of course assumptions about future developments of price levels, utilization rates and interest rates. The method of the annual profit and loss statement of course allows us to simplify things a bit and especially look at snapshots that are valid today. For example, compare the cost situation of existing power plants as we have access to the numbers from publicly available annual reports. In our simplified way, we are looking at three different types of cost, which are variable cost, fixed cost and profit expectation of the owners of the power plant. Variable cost could be fuel cost or emission certificates. We usually calculate them as cost per kilowatt hour. The main categories for fixed cost that we consider here are personnel, maintenance and repair and cost for land use as everything else. We will just summarize into others, for example, insurances, license fees, and so on. Then we have the cost related to the initial investment. The common way to take this into account is to linearly depreciate the initial investment by the number of years of intended use. And since you have to pay the bills to set up the plant in the beginning, usually you are getting some credit on which annual interest rates are paid. The last point is the profit expectation of the owners or equity owners for the economic risk of the operation, which also has to be included in the cost calculation. Here a potential margin expectation on the total variable and fixed cost can be used. Tax payments are of course not included as they are pretty much arbitrary and vary a lot all over the world. 
So finally, if you add up all these annual cost items together, divided by the annual energy produced, you can calculate the electricity production cost as an annual average, which is exactly the figure that is most interesting for us to compare different technologies. We have one more conceptual point to look into, and this is the positioning of electricity generation in the whole value chain. What we are looking into here is the electricity generation in the sense of the power plant operation. Many technologies are burning some sort of fuel and this fuel has to be mined or extracted, refined and distributed. Further downstream, the electric energy needs to be distributed, which is in the hands of grid operators. And finally, also the end consumers need to be taken care of. Consumption has to be measured, bills have to be issued, and also the states want to have their share in form of taxes. After all of that, the price for the end consumer is established. For every step in the value chain, there are external resources in form of materials and energy and work going in, and emissions and waste being produced as well. And this picture so far considers only the operations. There is another dimension, which is the investments and construction of the mines, the transport systems, the power plants themselves, and the grid. And in order to build these assets, also materials, energy, and work is put in, while here also emissions and waste are generated. In this video, we are calculating the cost of electricity generation, and these costs are basically measured at this point here. Which means that all costs from all upstream processes are taken into account. For example, the cost of the upstream operations are simply included in the fuel prices, while the cost of the power plant construction is included in form of depreciation. We are also looking into the emissions and environmental or health risks of electricity generation, but here we are only considering the operation of the power plants themselves. Of course, in order to get a complete picture, one has to consider the other parts of the value chain as well, but this will go beyond the scope of this video. But of course it could be part of future videos in this field. Finally, let's go into the details, starting with coal power, globally the most common electricity production method. Let's start talking about coal itself. The heat of combustion of coal is mainly associated from the exothermic oxidation of carbon to CO2. So the question is, how much carbon is actually in coal? I guess you have never heard of graphite or diamond or fullerenes being burned in a coal power plant, right? So coal is a mixture of many wanted and unwanted things. Instead of pure carbon, it contains more like a carbon-rich, undefined organic matter, and this mainly is delivering the thermal energy. Furthermore, coal contains various minerals. You don't want to have them, but it's difficult to physically separate them, and so they're also going into the power plant. They are converted into ash and gas emissions during the combustion process. Another component of coal is water. It is also unwanted as it is adding weight. The water will be evaporated upon heating in the plant. So how can we deal with this mixture when we want to characterize coal? The best way is to simply ignore it and not treat coal so much as a substance with a mass, but just refer to its thermal energy or lower heating value. So we can just consider the price per thermal energy or the CO2 emissions per thermal energy. There are different grades of coal. We just give you the trends here as the exact numbers can vary quite a lot. The higher the grade, the higher also the carbon content and consequently also the thermal energy per mass. For coal power plants, the lower ranks, uh, subbituminous coal or also called hard coal and lignite are the most common. Prices are way less than one cent per kilowatt hour thermal, a value that we should keep in mind as a reference. They have all similar CO2 emissions, around 0.33 kg per 1 kilowatt hour thermal. One should mention that lignite can be really rough. Sometimes it just contains 20% of carbon. So for lignite, the shipping costs are in general very high, as you have to transport so much useless weight, which leads to the fact that lignite power plants are usually in very close proximity to the lignite mine. 
In contrast, hard coal can be easily transported economically by ship or train all over the world, which allows coal power plants to be built almost anywhere. Just some access to transportation is necessary. Here is a scheme of how a coal power plant works. The first ingredient coal is entering the plant through this conveyor belt and is at first milled down to a fine powder. The second ingredient air is entering the plant at this position and is already preheated by the hot off gases. They are getting burned in the heating chamber. All non-combustible components are collected at the bottom in a giant ashtray. The hot gases are heating up highly pressurized water in a boiler to generate steam. This hot high pressure steam makes its way down to the first high pressure turbine in which it will lose some of its pressure and temperature. Then it is reheated again and entering a second intermediate pressure turbine and then a low pressure turbine. All three turbines are sitting on the same axis and power an electric generator that is producing electricity into the grid. In order to close the loop, the slightly warm, low pressure steam after the third turbine has to be condensed first to water. This is done by an external cooling circle. This cooling circle can be attached to a cooling tower or if there is an appropriate river or ocean available, can be directly cooled. The condensed water is then repressurized to the high pressure and then heated up and going back to the boiler. You might wonder why the cold steam is cooled first and then heated up again. Well, it is much easier and cheaper to pressurize basically incompressible water compared to highly compressible steam. And overall the route with water condensation is preferred. The last part that we have to look into is the fate of the off gases. Remaining ash particles are removed in an electrofilter. NOx can be removed catalytically using SCR catalysts with ammonia as a co-feed. Sulfuric oxides are usually absorbed by limestone, which is calcium carbonate and then oxidized to calcium sulfate, which is gypsum and is sold to the construction industry. At this point it is also discussed to capture CO2 from the flue gas, but the economics of this step will go beyond the scope of this video. Overall, CO2 capture is a very interesting topic and could be part of future videos. The whole power plant is designed in a way to increase the energy efficiency. Overall efficiencies of 35-40% to 40 can be reached. This is calculated as the net electric energy that is really leaving the plant into the grid and the lower heating value of the utilized coal. The biggest losses come from the turbine efficiency itself, which is roughly 45-50%. to 50%. And some heat losses into the environment or some incomplete combustion with carbon remaining in the ash. The electric generator itself is around 95-98% to 98 efficient and of course the plant uses energy for itself for all the pumps and filters and so on. Enough for the theory, let's look at some real examples. We will begin with Germany's largest hard coal power plant which can be found in the city of Mannheim. As you can see here, it is right next to a decent river, which is the Rhine River, and coal can be transported by ship easily. Furthermore, also no cooling towers are necessary. The plant has a nameplate capacity of about 2000 megawatts, and you can also see that the nameplate efficiency is 91%. As a side product, the plant is also producing heat with a nameplate capacity of 1500 megawatt thermal, mainly for residential heating. The nice thing about this plant is also that you can find all kinds of annual reports online, which allows us to assess its economics. In 2019, it sold almost 5 terawatt hours of electricity and a bit more than 2 terawatt hours thermal of heat. With the nameplate capacities, we can calculate the plant's utilization rate to be 29% or 2540 annual full load hours. This is surprisingly low. The capacity factor for heat is even lower, but I think this can be easily explained by the seasonality, simply as houses have to be heated in the winter time only. As a side remark, we are generally using the 2019 data in this overview, since they seem more representative than the 2020 data that is affected by different intensities of lockdowns in different parts of the world. The report tells us also that 1.8 million tons of a hypothetical standard coal were used, 
which transforms into 14.6 terawatt hour thermal and from which we can calculate the electricity production efficiency of this plant to be 34%. Furthermore, we can also calculate roughly how much CO2 has been emitted by this plant in 2019, which is around 5 million metric tons. From the reports, we can also see the annual profit and loss overview. First of all, we can see that the revenue of electricity is an order of magnitude higher than the revenue from heat. So we are not making a big mistake if we just ignore the heat part. In the report, they are only stating the total material cost, but separately giving average prices for coal and CO2 certificates. This allows us to calculate their contributions, leaving around 91 million euro for other material costs, which we assume to be also including simply parts for the plant itself. The plant employs 580 people, resulting in personal cost. We can see depreciation, interests, others, and also the profit. Interestingly, the profit is every year the same, as the owners are a consortium of electricity companies that are buying the electricity on a cost plus contract. Quite interesting is also the composition of the original invest, which was totally 3.5 billion euro, and which is mostly the equipment of the plant. The average depreciation time is set to 38 years. An important metric that we will encounter a lot in this video is how much a plant costs per kilowatt installed. Here we can calculate that to be 1600 euros per kilowatt. Finally, we can calculate the cost of electricity of this plant and especially look at the contributions of the various cost factors in absolute and relative numbers. Overall, the cost of electricity is around 10 cents per kilowatt hour, which is definitely quite high. In Germany, power plants have to buy CO2 certificates, and these alone correspond to 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour, as the plant is emitting around 1 kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Overall, the distribution of the various cost positions for coal power plants is relatively equal. Since we were a bit puzzled about the low utilization rate and the high overall cost, we were looking into a comparison to the numbers of previous years. Here we have a one-to-one -one comparison of the situation in 2019 and 2017. The yellow marks show the interesting points. Overall, the electricity capacity factor was considerably higher in 2017, and also the production efficiency. Although the cost for coal was higher in 2017 with 84 US dollar per metric ton, the overall cost was much lower, being around 6 cents per kilowatt hour. The main contributors are on the one hand the CO2 certificates that were trading at only 6 euro per metric ton in 2017, but also you can see that of course everything that is fixed cost like depreciation, personnel, maintenance, etc. is naturally contributing less if the plant is running at a higher capacity factor. And as a side remark, one should actually note that the value for personal cost in 2019 was unusually high due to some one-time effects related to pensions or something. 2017 has a much more realistic value. So one has to ask the question, why is the utilization of this plant so bad? Luckily, from the website energycharts.info, we can see the actual production of more or less each big plant in Germany with a very good time resolution. Here's the generated power of the Mannheim plant in January 2020 as an example. Don't be confused, the power is distributed to three different grid operators. What you see here is a stacked chart showing the total power generation of the plant. The first thing we note is that the maximum power of 2 gigawatt of this plant is almost never reached. Only a few times it is coming to full utilization. The temporal distribution shows different patterns on different timescales. First of all, we can see that each day Basil has more or less two peaks, which correspond to the morning hours and the evening hours, a very low dip at night and a smaller dip at noon. This shows how the plant is utilized. It is not producing electricity for the basic load, but rather follows demand peaks. The two daily factors are the overall low demand at night and also the maximum of solar power kicking in at noon. Furthermore, we can see that there are weeks where the demand is lower or higher. This can be basically explained by the amount of wind power being available. Actually, in this period, the wind speed was rather low in Germany, and in this week it was definitely higher. 
Now this chart is from winter. How does the situation look in the summertime? Here is the same chart from June 2020. We can see similar effects, but even more extreme. First of all, the scale is different. The maximum power is only one gigawatt, so only 50% of the nameplate capacity. In summer, the solar power generation in Germany is actually so high that this power plant is not really needed a lot. In times when there is not enough wind, a little bit of power is generated to cover mainly the morning and evening gaps. If there is enough wind available, the plant is running for weeks in almost idle mode. In summary, this hard coal power plant is operated to cover some peak demands for the most time of the year. And this at the end explains the relatively low utilization. I think it also explains the relatively low production efficiency because it is ramping up and down all the time, which is of course less efficient than steady operation at the designed capacity. Well, maybe in order to really understand the economics of coal power plants, Germany's largest power plant is not representative anymore due to the high amount of renewable energy sources that usually have grid priority. So let's look to one of Germany's neighbors, Poland. Poland is one of the countries in which coal is the major source for electricity production, with almost constantly producing around 130 terawatt hours annually. Of course, lately also other types were added to the mix. The largest energy producer in Poland is Polska Grupa Energetyczna or PGE. Here the images of the Belratów power plant, which is the largest coal-fired power plant in Europe, almost 5 gigawatt nameplate capacity. It is running with lignite, as we explained before, sitting right next to the mine. PGE operates several coal power plants, totally around 6.5 gigawatt of hard coal capacity and around 6.5 gigawatt of lignite capacity. From the 2019 reports, we can see the total energy produced and calculate the capacity factor. With 26% for hard coal and 57% for lignite, utilization was also not that great. PGE is buying hard coal from the market and digging out the lignite by themselves. The reports don't give all the numbers, but from the amount of hard coal bought and the total CO2 emissions, we can calculate the other numbers accurately enough. The overall production efficiency is around 30%. From the investor presentations, we can also get some financial data. The company is also having a renewables, heat and distribution business. These numbers here are our best try to dissect the electricity generation cost out of the reports and should be accurate enough for the purpose of this video. With the exchange rate of 1 euro being 4.3 zloty, we can get the electricity generation cost and compare it directly to the ones of the Mannheim plant. Please consider that the comparison of the total sales prices is not so important for our analysis, as PGE is also including tax and profit that is not shown here. Hard coal cost is quite high for PGE, if you consider that only one third of the electricity has been produced by hard coal. The CO2 certificate prices are lower for PGE than for the Mannheim plant. In terms of other costs, personal cost and depreciation, PGE is clearly lower, especially if you consider that these also account for the lignite mining operation. Overall, if you add all these costs together, one has to say that even in Poland, the price level for electricity production is higher than expected, as basically also the utilization of the hard coal plants is surprisingly low on average. Of course, if a country has almost all of its electricity being produced by coal, it also means that there needs to be extra capacity for peak times available, and this is simply expensive. As a last remark, the lower production efficiency also results in a bit higher CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour. The next technology we are looking into are power plants based on oil. Similar to coal, the thermal energy is also based on the oxidation of hydrocarbons to CO2 and water. Compared to coal, the size of the hydrocarbon molecules are smaller and the content of hydrogen is higher. So overall the material is liquid, which compared to coal is a big advantage in handling, as it can be pumped. Crude oil is a very broad mixture and is not directly burned in a power plant. It is first going into a refinery in which it is sorted by molecular chain length by a series of distillations, catalytic conversions and cleaning steps into light products like 
gasoline, diesel, jet fuels and various feedstocks for the chemical industry and also heavy products like fuel oil, lubricants or asphalt. Oil power plants are usually using some of the cheaper, heavier fuel oil fractions. This table here shows some key characteristics of fuel oil. Notably, the price for thermal energy from oil is around 5 to 8 times higher compared to coal, which is basically already the reason why oil power plants are not economic in places that have access to coal or gas. Locations where such power plants make economic sense is in remote places that require smaller units as transportation and storage of fuel oil is easier than with coal or gas. Or simply in areas where crude oil is so abundant and has low production cost, it's not a big surprise that the largest oil power plant is found in Saudi Arabia. It is the Schreiber plant just south of Jeddah and has a capacity of more than 5 gigawatt. The side product heat is used for an adjacent desalination plant and the investment costs were around $1000 per kilowatt. Since we did not find any reports on these few oil power plants in operation, we have just estimated the economics data for a prototypic power plant using our calculator. The key assumptions were a crude oil price of $60 per barrel, another $15 per barrel for the refinery and the transport to the plant, which translates into a thermal energy cost of around 4 cents per kilowatt hour thermal. We assumed the plant to be operated for a favorable 7000 annual full load hours at an efficiency of 35%. For the invest, we took the $1000 per kilowatt and some assumptions for other cost, maintenance, personnel were put into place. This table shows the breakdown of the cost of electricity. It is obvious that at this level of oil prices, just the fuel consumption alone would be at 13 cents per kilowatt hour, which is just a dominating factor and very expensive. So at this price, it even does not matter if we got the personnel cost or the interest rate right or wrong. It is just too expensive. If you wish, you can play with the input numbers. Maybe you have better insights, but it looks like oil power will be realistically not feasible. A totally different story will be seen for the next technology, which are natural gas fired power plants. Again, first the question, what is natural gas? Unlike coal and oil, natural gas is chemically much better defined, as it mainly is composed of methane and to some minor extents of ethane and propane. Raw natural gas contains contaminants like water, sulfur compounds or mercury. But, for example compared to coal, these are easily removed by initial purification steps. As you can see, the combustion reaction products contain much more water and less CO2 than the ones for coal and oil. Since the oxidation of hydrogen to water is also exothermic, the overall CO2 emission factor of around 0.2 kg CO2 per kilowatt hour thermal is also lower than that of coal or oil. The key point for gas is the price per thermal energy, which is around $3 per million British thermal units or around 1 cent per kilowatt hour thermal. This is still a bit higher than for coal but much cheaper than oil. Natural gas is also widely available and can be transported either by pipeline or in the liquid state by LNG tankers. Therefore, gas power plants are also found all over the world. Here is how it works. The key difference to other thermal plants, for example a coal power plant, is that the primary generation of heat can be done inside a special gas turbine, in a way that the kinetic energy of the expanding gases are powering the turbine directly. The residual heat is then used to power a classical steam turbine, very similar to what we have seen in the coal power plant. The setup is called combined cycle power plant and usually several gas-fired turbines are combined with one steam turbine. The overall efficiency is much higher than for a steam-only setup. 50 to 65% are achievable. This high efficiency in combination with the low cost and low CO2 emission factor of natural gas are the reason why such power plants can be economically very attractive. Another advantage is the directly fired gas turbine, which can be ramped up and down quite fast. Just think of a jet plane. Okay, powered by jet fuel, but more or less the same thing. So it can easily follow the grid load in minutes. If you think of countries that are well known for their natural gas production and export, certainly Russia comes into mind. 
And indeed, gas is also the most popular technology for electricity production in Russia, even further growing over the last 20 years. The plant Zyrgutskaya II in West Siberia, which is seen here on this picture, is one of the largest natural gas power plants in the world. It is operated by the company Unipro PJSC, which is the eighth largest electricity producer in Russia and operates in total four natural gas and one lignite power plant. If you look at this company a bit closer, as it is matching the purpose of this video very well, really focusing on electricity generation rather than a combination with natural gas extraction or a grid operation. Here is the 2019 data for the five plants. The total capacity is around 11 gigawatt, with 80% being gas and 20% coal. The utilization of plants varies quite a bit, but notably the Sergutskaya II plant had quite a high utilization of more than 60% in 2019. We can also calculate the average efficiencies to be around 40% or a bit less. One should note that these plants are mostly using purely steam power units and only lately were stepwise being expanded by combined cycle gas turbines. For example, the Yevinskaya plant consists of roughly 600 megawatt of steam units that were built in the 1960s, which operate at efficiencies around 35%. 10 years ago, one 400 megawatt combined cycle gas turbine unit was added, operating at an efficiency above 50%. From the reports, we can have a look at the financial numbers. Of course, we are looking here at a dilution of 20% by coal power, but since Unipro is also buying the coal for our purposes, this is good enough. We get a good feeling for the cost of electricity production from natural gas in Russia. We have calculated those per kilowatt hour and for comparison also converted it with the 2019 average exchange rate of 70 ruble per euro. The first thing that can be noted, overall the costs are very much lower than what we have seen thus far in this video. If you're basically sitting with your plant on a gas reservoir, fuel contribution can be as low as 1 cents per kilowatt hour. And fuel prices are even making up for the majority of the cost. The sum of the operating cost, including personnel, depreciation and maintenance, is below 1 cents per kilowatt hour as well. This is really cost effective. At the end, two main aspects have to be considered for gas power. What is the utilization factor and how cheap is the fuel? The CO2 emission factor is actually calculated only for the gas power plants of Unipro. So with around 0.5 kg of CO2 per kilowatt hour, it is around half of what is expected for coal. Keeping in mind that with modern combined cycle gas turbines, this value would be around 0.4. It has been noted that in Russia there are no extra costs for CO2 certificates. So we did a quick calculation how these would influence the overall cost. At a level of 25 euro per metric ton of CO2, which was the European price in 2019, suddenly the cost for CO2 certificates would be the highest contributor in the cost breakdown, adding more than a cent per kilowatt hour. The next technology is nuclear power. The only fuel that goes into a nuclear power plant are uranium dioxide pellets. Natural uranium is composed of three isotopes, having either 238, 235 or 234 nuclei in the core. Uranium 235 is the starting point of the nuclear reactions that release a high amount of thermal energy around 22 gigawatt hour thermal per kilogram of uranium 235. On a mass basis, this is around 2 million times higher than that of fossil fuels. A natural uranium contains around 0.7% of uranium-235. Here are some of the reactions in detail. Uranium-235 is only being able to absorb slow neutrons to form a uranium-236, which is an unstable isotope. And this one has several options to split into other elements, here are two possibilities shown, into krypton and barium releasing two neutrons, or into strontium and xenon releasing three neutrons. The key point is that the newly released neutrons are extremely fast, and their kinetic energy is much too high for them to be absorbed effectively by another uranium-235, so they have to be slowed down. 
and this is done by so-called moderator materials, for example water and graphite. Now we have to consider two things. There is another possible reaction and this is the capture of let's call it fast neutrons by uranium-238, forming uranium-239 which is stable and therefore acts as a trap for neutrons. Furthermore, the protons from the moderator water can capture a neutron and become a deuteron, another trap. So the engineering problem in the design of a reactor is to make sure that enough of the extremely fast neutrons from the fission reaction find their way to another uranium-235. In fact, this rate should be constant over time to achieve a stable operation. In practice, this is not working out with uranium and water in its natural form as either the uranium-238 or the protons are simply capturing too many neutrons. There are two basic solutions available. Either you stick with cheap water and enrich the amount of uranium-235 in the pellets to around 2-5%, or you stick with uranium in its natural isotope ratio, but replace water by expensive deuterated water, also called heavy water. While both strategies are commercially used, the more popular route is to use enriched uranium dioxide pellets. Here is a summary of the key characteristics of this fuel. Price seems to be quite high, around $1,500 per kilogram, but it is being burned up to around 1 million kilowatt hour thermal per kilogram, which corresponds to only 0.15 cents per kilowatt hour thermal, and this is by far cheaper than any of the fossil fuels. And of course, the nuclear reaction itself is also not releasing any CO2. Considering reactor designs that are currently in operation worldwide, one can distinguish between boiling water reactors and pressurized water reactors. Here is a schematic view of a pressurized water reactor. The fuel elements are constantly heating up water in this primary circuit. The heat from the primary circuit is exchanged in a boiler and heats up the cold high pressure water of the secondary circuit, generating high pressure steam. The steam is then propelling the turbines, losing temperature and pressure on the way. The turbine is powering the generator and the cold low pressure steam needs to be condensed with external cooling water from river, sea or cooling tower and then being repressurized to close the circle. We have seen this already in the case of the coal power plants. Nuclear power plant designs are constantly being improved, mainly towards efficiency and increased safety. It should be mentioned that there are also a few radically new designs in the R&D stage, the so-called Generation 4 systems, but covering these goes beyond the scope of this video. Nuclear power plants can be found all over the world. Some of the biggest installations are in Ontario, Canada, for example the Darlington nuclear power plant just east of Toronto on Lake Ontario, or Bruce nuclear power plant at the shores of Lake Huron. These reactors are using the so-called CANDO design with deuterated water as a moderator and natural uranium fuel. Let's look at the company Ontario Power Generation or OPG that is operating mainly hydroelectric and nuclear power plants. Here's the data for the nuclear part from 2019. They have two sites, Darlington and Pickering, currently with a total nameplate capacity of 5.7 gigawatt and an annual production of around 43 terawatt hours. And this corresponds to more than 7,500 annual full load hours or a utilization of 87%. And this is by far the highest we have seen so far in this video. Here we see the annual performance of the nuclear segment in absolute numbers and also the cost per kilowatt hour in Canadian dollars and euros. The sales price is something between 6 and 9 Canadian euro dollar cents, which is also far from super cheap. The cost for fuel is less than 10% of the total cost and obviously nuclear power plants are not required to buy any CO2 certificates. But the main costs are actually related to personnel, maintenance, administration, waste management, etc. So the relative fixed cost contribution for nuclear power plants is so high compared to fossil fuel plants, it is just not economic to leave them idle. And this is why they also run at a high utilization rate, covering the base load of the grid. Technically, nuclear power plants can also be ramped up and down to follow the grid load. 
This is for example done in countries like France that have about 80% of its electricity being generated by nuclear power plants. Let's look at another example. This is the Gösken Deniken nuclear power plant located right on the river Aare in the beautiful canton of Solothurn in Switzerland. It is using the other technology route, so combining light water with enriched uranium dioxide fuel. There is a single company operating only this plant and their annual reports give us valuable insights into the economics. The plant is in operation since 1979 with some modernization in between and we are looking here into a comparison of 2019 with around 20 years ago. The nameplate capacity of this 1 gigawatt plant has been improved a bit mainly at the side of the steam turbine. As you can see, the thermal capacity of the reactor is still the same, but the efficiency to generate electricity out of it has been improved from 32% to 34%. Still around 5% of the gross electricity is used internally, mainly for powering all the pumps of the cooling systems. The plant is operating at a very high utilization rate of around 90%, similar to what we have discussed in the previous examples from Canada. So basically the plant produced almost exactly the same amount of electricity in 2001 and 2019. Interestingly, in 2001 only 376 people were needed to achieve that, while in 2019 540 people were necessary. Looks like a very high loss of productivity. We're not sure what is really behind it. At least the assumption would be that there are not more people necessary to actually operate the plant. Maybe some services have been insourced or what might be the most obvious reason, the amount of regulations, bureaucracy and reporting surrounding nuclear power has increased a lot over the last 20 years. Here are the annual numbers in million Swiss francs. And here we have calculated the electricity production cost and also today's numbers in euros, just in case you're not familiar with Swiss francs. Remarkably, the total sales price for the electricity is pretty much the same in 2019 and 2001. Now you need to know that the average inflation in Switzerland is very low and was something between 0 and 1% over this time period. Overall, the price is lower than what we have seen for the Canadian power plants. We would expect that the fuel costs are higher in the Swiss plant than in the Canadian plant since enriched fuel is used. However, you cannot really see this in the reports easily. In the Canadian case, this value was 0.5 euro cents, but also fuel storage and handling fees were included in the fuel contribution, while these might be found in other buckets in the Swiss report. So just a reminder, Always keep in mind when comparing different reports, they are usually structured somehow differently. What is quite striking here are the relatively high provisions that are in here for waste and decommissioning, showing one of the disadvantages of nuclear power plants. At the end of life, it is quite complicated and work intensive to get rid of it. And this brings us right to the next technology, geothermal power. The principle of geothermal power is relatively simple. First you drill a hole into the ground and hope that you find some hot fluids coming out. Ok, usually you have to check this beforehand. At the surface the fluid is separated into hot steam and liquids. The steam is used to power a turbine, then condensed and, together with the previously separated liquids, sent back to the ground through a different hole in order to close the loop. While the thermal energy flow of the Earth is enormous, the places where geothermal electricity generation is possible are rather limited, as there are some prerequisites necessary. The fluids should have a high temperature of several hundred degrees C and be close to the surface, which often holds true for areas with active or formerly active volcanoes. Keeping this in mind, it is not a surprise which countries are in the top list of the currently installed capacity of geothermal power. Here are some pictures of plants in famous regions like the Geysers field in California or from Iceland. Let's take a deeper look at the economic details and move to a country in which geothermal power plays a big role. Let's move to the Philippines. Here you see the view of the Palimpinon geothermal power plant embedded in the spectacular landscape of these tropical mountains. Energy Development Corporation or EDC is the largest producer of geothermal energy in the Philippines. 
You can find various reports on their website. These are quite interesting reads besides the technical and financial data. You can also learn a lot what the company is doing in regional activities for their employees, education, the environment and more. The company operates plants in six different sites with a total capacity of 1.2 gigawatt and generated almost 8 gigawatt hour in 2019. So the annual full load hours of 6,500 are quite high, corresponding to an average utilization rate of 75%. We can already understand the pattern from the nuclear power plants. For these plants the fuel is actually for free and you have almost only fixed cost during operation, so no benefit in not using them. If we look a bit closer, we can see that the total revenue of all geothermal power plants is 4.6 Philippine pesos per kilowatt hour, which is around 8 cents. On a side note, EDC also operates other renewable power plants, but to a smaller extent. And interestingly enough, the revenue or cost for those is higher than for geothermal energy. We will look into the detailed cost distribution in a bit. But before that, let's have a look at the greenhouse gas emissions. While it might be assumed that geothermal energy is emission free, in reality there are also greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide and methane being dissolved in the geothermal fluids. On average, EDC's emissions are around 0.1 kg of CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour, and this value is quite different for different geothermal resources. This is still only 10% of the value of coal, but at least it is also not zero. Here is the financial data of EDC with the contributions of the different cost positions. For these numbers, one has to keep in mind that this is 80% geothermal and 20% other renewables. So yeah, not fully precise, but this is good enough for our purposes and we get a good feeling about the cost distribution of geothermal energy. As usual, we calculated the cost per kilowatt hour produced and converted it also to euros. We can see that although the fuel costs are zero, there is quite a substantial amount of cost associated to personnel, depreciation, services, which really shows that geothermal power is not necessarily for free. Especially the effort for exploration of the geothermal resources and drilling the holes is quite high, and on top comes the usual equipment like the turbines and generators. I'm not sure if there will be big breakthroughs in drilling coming, but it seems that this would be necessary to grow the geothermal energy use, especially towards exploiting less and less attractive reservoirs. In the Philippines, no CO2 certificates have to be bought, but just for the sake of completeness, if CO2 certificates at a price of 25 euro per metric ton would have to be bought, this will add another 0.3 cents per kilowatt hour of cost. Now we move to the third most common method of electricity generation, and of course currently the largest one of the renewables, hydropower. Let's start with a beautiful view of the Itaipu Dam, which accommodates one of the largest power plants in the world with a total nameplate capacity of 14 gigawatt. The annual production of this plant alone is 100 terawatt hour. The dam is located at the Paraná River and is directly on the border of Paraguay and Brazil. It started operation in 1984. So how does hydropower work? Basically very simple. You have two basins of water. Water flows from the upper basin to the lower basin and the difference in potential energy is converted into kinetic energy of flowing water and via a turbine into electric energy. The potential energy difference is mass m times gravitational acceleration g times the difference in height delta h. And the generated power is the energy per time, which is basically given by the mass per time or mass flow m dot and the efficiency of the turbine eta, which is usually around 90%. In order to produce a lot of energy, you want to have a high delta h, which usually means a high dam and also a high mass flow rate m dot. Of course, on average, the mass flow rate has to match the inflow rate of water into the upper basin, which is coming from precipitation in the mountainous areas and flowing downwards as rivers. So if you want to increase the average flow rate, this basically means you would have somehow to have it let rain more. As for most dams, there is a flexibility in the water level of the upper basin, so inflow and outflow do not have to be equal all the time. 
This means that in principle electricity generation can be tuned to follow the load, but even more, the upper reservoir can be so large that also seasonal control of the water flow is performed, which can benefit agriculture but also prevent floodings. So in these cases the economic benefit of the dam goes beyond electricity generation alone. Of course, construction of a big dam and creation of a large artificial water reservoir is a major change for the environment and the people living in the respective area. And this is rather perceived as a disadvantage and this needs to be taken into account when evaluating the whole project. There are also hydropower plants that don't have a hold up in the upper basin and look more like rivers. In this case, in and outflow in the upper basin is always the same. If you look into hydropower, there's no way not to look at China. The company China Yangtze Power is the largest producer of hydropower in the world. Here's a picture of the famous Three Gorges Dam that accommodates the largest power plant in the world. Along the Yangtze River and its connected upstream river system, the company operates six major dams, out of which the two most upstream ones have just been finished recently. In 2019, the Baihetan and Wudongde still being under construction, the total nameplate capacity was 45.5 gigawatt and 210.5 terawatt hours of electricity have been generated. The utilization for the power plants is around 50%, which can be explained by the seasonal rain patterns. If the inflow in the upper reservoir is high and you want to catch as much energy as possible, you have to build in enough turbines to do that. But this automatically means that there will be too many turbines for the time when the water inflow is lower. Sometimes it makes even economic sense not to capture all the energy during peak inflows, but rather let some water pass by unused in order to increase the average utilization rate of the turbines. Here you can see the invest numbers for the four dams in operation. If you calculate this, you find overall around 1000 US dollar per kilowatt, which is relatively low. The dam structures are contributing the most to the cost. Interestingly, for depreciation calculation, a time span of 45 to 50 years is calculated. Here are the annual numbers for China Yangtze Power for 2019 and calculated as cost per kilowatt hour and converted this time to US dollar. The total sales price for electricity is around 4 cents per kilowatt hour, which is a reasonably cheap price. In the cost split we can see that operational costs are almost zero. They are around 0 0.5 cents per kilowatt hour. The majority of the cost comes from depreciation and financing. Furthermore, around half of the revenues goes as income to the owners and tax to the state. So if we remove all of these financing items and restrict ourselves to operation and depreciation, then this will be electricity costs of around 1 cent per kilowatt hour. And this is really amazing and explains why hydropower can be found in so many places in the world. It is just damn cheap. Related to hydropower is tidal power. Here's an example of one of the few tidal power plants in the world. It is called Usine Marémotrice de la Rance en France. La Rance is a river flowing into a quite wide reservoir and then into the sea. At this position there is a barrage in which 24 turbines are integrated with a total nameplate capacity of 240 megawatt. Tides are flowing in and out of this reservoir. There are always two cycles per day. A combination of gates and turbines in the barrage is used to convert potential energy differences of the water having different levels on both sides of the barrage. Energy production is totally predictable, but it is intermittent. The power plant achieves a capacity factor of 24% or 2100 annual full load hours. Economics of such tidal power plants are similar to hydropower plants. Investments are high at the beginning but once built they have almost no running cost. In this case also the barrage has a second function, which is a road connecting the cities on both sides of the river, so the investment cost can be reduced of the savings of having a bridge at this position. Overall there are not so many places in the world where such a barrage seems to be economically feasible. Another one is in South Korea. The Shiva Lake tidal power station is actually very similar to the French example. 
and it also achieves around 2100 annual full load hours, so this seems to be the technical optimum for such plants. This barrage is located directly in the approach path of Incheon Airport. The airport is around 20 kilometers in this direction. Probably this picture was taken from an incoming plane. Some information on the construction cost were also given, which is around 2200 US dollar per kilowatt. Let's move over to wind power, the rising star over the last 10 years in renewable energy. The principle of wind power is the conversion of the kinetic energy of moving air, also known as wind, into electricity using a wind turbine. So what is the kinetic energy of wind? The general formula for kinetic energy is E equals one half mv squared. V is the wind speed and m the mass of the wind. The mass of the wind can be written as the volume of wind times its density rho and the volume is regarded as the volume of air that is passing the area of the rotor A, taking into account the wind speed and the time of observation. This allows us to write for the wind power, which is the energy per time, P equals one half A times rho times V to the power of three. This tells us already an important point. Higher wind speeds are better for higher power. Actually, they are really better, as they go into the equation by the power of three. Basically, one can say that with higher wind speed, not only have the single molecules in air a higher kinetic energy, but also there are more molecules transported through the turbine. A wind turbine cannot extract 100% of the wind energy. You can imagine that if you would do so, the speed of air after the turbine would be zero and the air would immediately pile up and block all other incoming air and the wind would just start flowing around the turbine. In fact, the theoretical limit can be calculated to be 59.3% and this is called the Betts limit. In practice, there are of course some inefficiencies, but modern turbines can reach around 50%, so this is already very close to the theoretical limit. Wind speeds are fluctuating over time, but average wind speeds and therefore the wind power densities are known for most locations. For example, the website globalwindatlas.info gives a very good overview and we'll have a look at that in a moment. Wind turbines are optimized for the local wind speed patterns, especially at which wind speed the nameplate capacity is reached. This graph shows an example of such a consideration. In red, you see the power curve of this Vestas V90 turbine. The power generation increases with increasing wind speed, but is kept at 3 megawatt, which is reached around 14 meters per second. This means for higher wind speeds, you would not be able to capture the additional power. And also for even higher wind speeds, the turbines are shut off to avoid potential damage. The power curves of wind turbines can be tuned by their engineering design, which will also affect the cost of the turbine itself. In blue you see the wind speed distribution curve for this hypothetical place. So this means how often a certain wind speed is occurring on average. Combining the two curves, you can get a hint how much energy can be actually produced with this wind speed distribution and this specific wind turbine. Such calculations allow you to choose the best possible wind turbine for this location, taking also into account the cost of the wind turbine. In this particular example, it looks like this wind turbine is not matching the wind distribution very well, as the maximum power is almost never reached. A turbine with a power curve more optimized for lower wind speeds would probably be more economic here. With the power of the wind turbine being set, the annual energy generation is, as we know, calculated in full load hours. Typical values for onshore installations are around 2000 to 2500 and for offshore installations around 4000 annual full load hours. This is a world map showing basically the average wind speeds or in this case the resulting mean power densities of wind. In principle, the higher the better, and the more economic it will be to operate a wind farm, unless of course the location and the terrain is not suitable for other reasons. Wind farms might make sense also in areas of lower mean power density, but most likely everything that is starting to get somehow yellowish or better on this map is of interest. So what can we see here? 
First of all, usually the offshore areas are having higher power densities, making them attractive positions for wind farms. Of course, you have to somehow fix the turbine on the ground, so only in areas with relatively shallow waters, currently maybe water depths up to 60 meter can be exploited, preferably much lower though. Areas in which offshore wind energy is currently very popular are the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, but also along the coast of China there are attractive locations with shallow waters. But you will find many areas that look attractive from the wind power densities, like this red spot here in the Mediterranean Sea or here in the Atlantic Ocean, or the coast of California, Oregon, Namibia, South Africa, but the waters there are getting pretty deep quickly. So with the current technology it seems not to be economic to exploit these potentials. If you want to look up water depths, Google Earth is a very good source. If you look around the equator area, wind speeds are generally lower. Actually there are many regions in the world where wind power seems to be not feasible at all, simply due to the lack of wind, for example in parts of Latin America, Central Africa, India, Southeast Asia, there might be only a few selected spots where wind power is really feasible. On the other hand, there are many prime regions for onshore wind power. For example, this area here in the US from Texas to North Dakota might become the largest wind farm in the world. Ireland and the UK are definitely having exceptionally high wind power densities, reaching red colors even onshore. Another interesting area is this area here in the northwest of Africa which is not only a prime spot for wind energy, but also for solar energy, as we will see later. Of course, the area is mainly desert and not many people living there, but this might change at some point in time with this abundance of energy potential. Other than that, of course, here in Kazakhstan, northern part of China, Mongolia, Australia and Patagonia, Norway, we have a lot of yellow spots. Also in the Arctic region, not sure if such remote areas are relevant though. Here is an example of a very large wind farm, the Roscoe Wind Farm in Texas. It was completed already back in 2009 and consists of 627 individual turbines, adding up to a nameplate capacity of around 780 megawatt. On average, it delivers around 2 terawatt hour annually, which corresponds to 2800 annual full load hours, which is a very good value for onshore wind sites. The average wind speed here is around 7.5 meter per second. And for our economic consideration, construction costs are very interesting and they are reported to be around $1 billion, which corresponds to $1,280 per kilowatt. Based on this value, we try to estimate the cost distribution for a hypothetical wind farm of this size. Total production cost might be in the range of 5 to 6 cents per kilowatt hour, which is already very competitive compared to what we have seen already for other technologies. The important part is that the vast majority of the cost is associated to the investment and also financing this, whereas maintenance and operations could be below 2 cents per kilowatt hour. Needless to say that there are no costs for fuel or CO2 certificates. So what are the investment costs? The investment consists of purchasing the turbines, transporting them to the site, preparing the site, installing everything and connecting the turbines to the grid. A big portion of this investment are of course the turbines themselves. So to understand their price level a bit better, let's have a look at a wind turbine producer. Vestas, a Danish company, is the world's largest producer of wind turbines. In their annual reports you can find lots of information about their business. Here we are showing their reported order backlog in million euro and in megawatt. This allows us to calculate the average price per kilowatt of their pipeline. As you can see the prices have decreased over the last years, but the price drop was stagnating recently. Usually you would expect a constant decrease in price level due to economy of scale, production debottlenecking and continuous innovations. Whether this trend here is indicative of a bottom is not clear. It could also be that Vestas is just able to sell more services on top of their hardware and is therefore able to keep the price level constant. Or maybe it is just in light of a huge demand. As you can see, Vestas is able to increase not only production numbers every year, but also the average nameplate capacity per unit is constantly going up. 
It will be very interesting to follow these trends over the next years, how low the price level will become and in which regions in the world wind power will eventually be cheaper than power from coal or gas. Now, the technology we have all been waiting for, photovoltaic power. I think everybody knows how photovoltaic cells look like and what they are doing, but how does a photovoltaic cell actually work? It is a beautiful combination of chemistry, physics and engineering, so let's go through it step by step. The base material of today's solar cells is silicon. Silicon is a solid material which forms a regular crystalline structure that is schematically depicted here with every grey dot being a silicon atom. Silicon crystallizes in the so-called diamond structure. In this structure each silicon atom has four nearest neighbors and this makes sense since each silicon atom has four valence electrons, so it can form chemical bonds with four other silicon atoms. Two electrons can occupy the bonding orbitals of a single bond, and thereby every silicon atom has eight electrons around itself, fulfilling the most common valence rule. In a crystalline solid, the term bond is usually not used, but rather the term band of states which kind of describes the sum of all bonds that are in a way interacting with each other. In the silicon structure there is a so-called valence band that can occupy four electrons per atom and has a bonding characteristic. Furthermore, the so-called conduction band can also occupy four electrons per atom and these states are of higher energy and have anti-bonding characteristic. As we mentioned, pure silicon has exactly four electrons per atom, so the states in the valence band are fully occupied, while the states in the conduction band are empty. A solar cell does not consist of pure silicon, but rather a doped version. This means that some of the silicon atoms are replaced by other atoms. In this case, one side is doped with boron and the other side is doped with phosphorus. Since boron has only three valence electrons per atom, doping with boron will overall lead to less electrons being present. This is called p-doping. P for positive, but don't confuse it with positively charged. Boron has of course one proton less as well, so the overall charge balance is neutral. On the other side, phosphorus has five valence electrons per atom, so one more than silicon, and this will lead to a surplus of electrons, and this is called n-doping. The whole setup is called a p-n junction. Let's look at the bonding situation. In the picture of the localized bonds, boron is also binding to silicon atoms, but since it has only three valence electrons, one of the four bonds is only filled with one instead of two electrons. In the picture of the bands, this means that the valence band is not fully occupied, as there are on average less than four electrons available in the boron-doped side. In a similar way, phosphorus brings a fifth electron, so in the localized picture, one of the so-called anti-bonding orbitals will be filled with this extra electron. And in the picture of the bands, these extra electrons will be found in the states of the conduction band. Now here comes an important insight. The situation has also a big effect on electrical conductivity. Conductivity is associated with the ability of electrons to hop from one state to another state. But this is only working well if they can do that between states that are lying within the same band, since the energy gap is small between them. Hopping from a state in the valence band into a state in the conduction band is not possible as the energy gap is too high. Therefore, pure silicon is a bad electrical conductor since there are no free states in the valence band for electrons to hop around and also no electrons in the conduction band that could hop around either. In case of the doped materials, conductivity is obviously much higher. Now, what happens in the situation of the p-n junction? On the n side you have electrons extra in anti-bonding states and on the p sides there are electrons missing in bonding states. So what is happening? Electrons will move over from the n side to the p side. Basically, if you wish, boron and phosphorus are reacting remotely with each other to form boron phosphide a compound that is also crystallizing in the same structural arrangement. What are the consequences? 
First of all, conductivity is again low in the PN junction, since the valence band is getting filled again and the conduction band is getting emptied. Furthermore, there is an electric field formed since the P side is getting negatively charged with a surplus of electrons and the N side is getting positively charged. Alright, this is the band situation for the PN junction and now let's see what happens if light is hitting the solar cell. When light hits, it can happen that a photon is absorbed by an electron. And those electrons are called excited electrons and are having a higher energy. In fact, they are getting excited from the valence band into the conduction band by the absorption of light, leaving behind holes in the valence band. Now, two things can happen. Either the electron makes its way down again to the valence band and thereby releasing its extra energy as heat, or the electron moves along the lines of the electric field to the positively charged side. The missing electron or the hole can of course be filled by neighboring electrons, leaving again a hole there, so there will be a tendency that the hole moves towards the negatively charged side. So one ends up with a lot of electrons in high energy states on the end side, and a lot of holes which are unoccupied low energy states on the P side. One good way to deal with this situation is to connect current collectors on both sides and have electrons flow out on the right side and electrons come in on the left side. This works if you close the electric circuit and the difference in energy of electrons on the right and left side gives rise to a voltage and electric work can be done. And this circle continues as long as light is shining into the PN junction and the electric circuit is closed. The rest is engineering. Of course, the current collector needs to be transparent to have light entering into the silicon. Reflections from its surface should be minimized to get as much light as possible into the cell. The absorption of photons should be as effective as possible and especially the recombination of excited electrons and holes should be minimized to avoid energy losses in the form of heat. What are the key parameters of solar cells? First, the efficiency, which is basically how much percent of the power of the incoming light is transferred into usable electric power. On the website of the NREL you can find a chart which is continuously updated, showing the development of the best research cell efficiencies of different technologies. The record stands at 47%, but these cells are multi-junction cells, actually capturing a broader bandwidth of wavelength with different sets of materials. Unfortunately, those technologies are also more complicated to manufacture and are therefore not economically viable for mass-scale electricity production yet. The record for crystalline silicon-based cells currently stands around 26%. Improvements here were very small over the last 25 years for lab cells, so this technology seems to have reached a maximum in its principal performance. There are several new technologies emerging over the last 10 years, which are still witnessing quite steep progress. Especially the perovskite-based cells have also reached 25% recently. Of course, efficiency is not everything, cost, stability, scalability still needs to be demonstrated, but as long as there are lines going upwards in this chart, there is progress. Besides its efficiency, the other important parameters of a solar cell are the cost, size and maximum power of a module. A module includes a number of cells, a stable framework and all electric connections and is usually considered as the smallest building block for photovoltaic installations. Here is the exemplary data of a module from Canadian Solar. For solar cells the nameplate capacity is called peak power. It is denoted as 500 watt peak in this case. It is measured under standard test conditions with a radiation of 1000 watt per square meter. The module efficiency is 21.2% and the size 2.36 square meters. From these two numbers we can calculate that you need 4.7 square meters of module to achieve 1 kilowatt peak. Or in other words, you can build 0.212 kilowatt peak per square meter. You have seen this number before. Sure, if you radiate 1000 watt per square meter and capture 21.2%, that is what you get. 
The prices for solar modules are continuously falling. On the website pvexchange.com you can find some price levels for Europe. Depending on the efficiency, these vary between 200 and 300 euros per kilowatt peak. This is already quite low. Compare this to 750 euro per kilowatt for wind turbines or 1000 to 1500 euros for a fossil fuel power plant. Of course, a module is not a power plant yet, but it is getting interesting. What is missing for the complete economics is of course the location. It influences the installation cost for the modules, including transformers and grid connection, whether they are roof mounted, ground mounted or floating on water. Furthermore, land use of solar farms is higher than for other power plants and most importantly, how much light is available. For this, there is also a nice website, you can guess, globalsolaratlas.info. Here's the world map showing global horizontal irradiation in kilowatt hour photon energy per square meter. The biggest impact factors are the latitude, so basically the angle of the sunlight hitting on the ground, and the weather, especially clouds, fog and moisture. From the global horizontal irradiation, you can derive the photovoltaic power potential. This assumes that the photovoltaic cells are mounted in an optimal tilt towards the sun and not horizontally. The photovoltaic power potential tells you how much electric energy in kilowatt hour you can harvest per kilowatt peak installed. The number of the yearly totals is exactly the number of the annual full load hours. The top spots are of course deserts and mountainous areas like the Sahara Desert, Namibia, the Andes, but also the Middle East, China, Mongol, Australia and the US and Mexico. But at the end the difference between top and mid spots are not so high. Some of the top spots are only in mountain ranges that are badly accessible. So everything that is starting to look a bit yellowish on the map is probably decent. Interestingly, China has a bit of an issue in their populated area in the east due to the weather, usually a strong cloudiness, maybe also a bit of smog, this contribution will improve in the future. If you look at this map, it looks like Saudi Arabia will not only be the top country in cheap oil and gas, but also one of the top countries for unlimited electricity at least during the daytime. Yes, an important point about solar power is that the sun is not shining on the modules all the time. There are several fluctuations over different time spans. The most obvious is the day and night rhythm that is pretty much predictable, but there will be days or weeks where the weather is more or less cloudy. And there are seasonal fluctuations, mostly summer winter. In some areas this could be rainy seasons. And this map is showing the seasonality index. This is the ratio of the expected output in the best month versus the worst month. The biggest factor influencing the seasonality index is the latitude. In the right table we went down from 55 degree to 35 degree in Europe and tracked the global annual radiation under optimal tilt and the seasonality. The finding is that above 40 degree latitude the seasonality index is rising quite steeply above 2. This means it is not straightforward to use photovoltaic power alone in this area, even if you solve the day-night storage issue. You would have to think about the winter time and usually keep some additional infrastructure. In contrast, in areas in which the seasonality is lower than 2 or even better lower than 1.5, Potentially photovoltaics could be the only source of electricity if you solve the energy storage problem for the short-term fluctuations. Here is a chart where people are actually living, so the population as a function of the latitude. Interestingly, three quarters of the population lives within 35 degree north and 35 degree south, and another 11% between 35 and 40. So for most of the population, at least the seasonality index is not a big deal. Areas that actually have this seasonality problem, like Europe, Canada and Russia, turn out to be a bit of a niche market in this respect. Let's look at some examples. The largest solar park in the world is the Batla Solar Park in the northwest part of India, with a total nameplate capacity of 2.2 gigawatt and delivering an average of around 1800 annual full load hours. Here are the side characteristics, so basically stable electricity generation is possible throughout the year. 
the lowest month being in July, which is probably due to the monsoon season in India at that time of the year. Overall, the land use is quite enormous, with 57 square kilometers covered with solar cells. Usually there is a factor of 2-3 to three between the area of the solar panels themselves and the area for the solar park, as there needs to be a spacing between the panels in order to avoid shading. Here is another example, the Solar Star in California, Mojave Desert, a prime location for solar energy with more than 2200 annual full load hours and a seasonality of less than 1.5. From these examples we can see that the land use for solar parks is around 17 to 20 square meters per kilowatt peak. Or another figure that can be remembered, for 1 terawatt hour annually you need around 8 to 10 square kilometers. Well, so how cheap can solar power get? Here we are doing a calculation estimating a solar park in a prime location with relatively cheap investment costs. We are not sure how soon we will see such numbers and how much it exactly takes to operate a solar park. Consider this more for educational purposes. If you have better values, feel free to use them in the calculator or just play around to see what is possible. The assumptions that were put in, very good solar panels with 22% efficiency, annual solar energy of 2600 kilowatt hour per square meter, 2 million square meter of solar panels leading to a nameplate capacity of 440 megawatt peak, 95% inverter efficiency leading to 1086 gigawatt hour annual production. Investment cost for the solar panels $180 per kilowatt peak, which might be even a realistic price today if you order in these dimensions. Other investment costs of $220 per kilowatt peak, which adds up to $400 per kilowatt peak total, assuming 25 years of depreciation. Annual interest rate of 4% on 80% of the investment. Personnel costs. Okay, we don't know how many people are needed to operate such a solar park, so let's say 20 times 60k. Land lease of $0.5 per square meter and an annual maintenance and other cost of $1.4 million. Under these assumptions, the total cost of electricity produced would be 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So this would be very close to our 1 cent per kilowatt hour target. Main contributions are depreciation, interest and land lease. We also included a profit expectation. Actually, solar cells are losing some of their efficiency every year, which is ignored in this calculation, so maybe an efficiency of 20% on average is more realistic. Anyway, within all technologies that we have looked at, photovoltaics seem to have the biggest potential for cheap electricity. Is this calculation totally unrealistic? We think not, and there is some evidence from recent power purchase agreements in Saudi Arabia in which a bit of 1.04 cents per kilowatt hour was made. Of course, you cannot transfer purchase power agreement prices directly to production cost as some parts like land lease or so might not be covered. It will be very interesting to see these developments over the next years, as major suppliers in this industry are continuously ramping up their production capacities and further cost reductions should be achievable. Of course, electricity production cost will increase if energy storage is taken into account to cover the day-night situation. But this will be the topic of future videos. How does solar thermal power compare to photovoltaics? The principle of solar thermal is to concentrate the sunlight with mirrors or lenses onto a receiver that consists of a light-absorbing material and that is heated up. That's why this technology is also called concentrated solar power or CSP. The generated heat is then used to produce steam and this is powering a conventional steam turbine power plant. Since the position of the sun is moving during the day, the system needs to be able to track this movement in order to keep the focus on the receiver. There are three basic designs for such power plants, the dish, the trough and the tower. The parabolic dish with a Stirling engine in the focus point was reported to have an efficiency of up to 30%, which is exceeding current photovoltaics. But overall, this system seems to be too expensive and hasn't been commercially successful yet.
Solar plants using the parabolic trough technology and the solar tower are currently in operation in various parts of the world. The overall efficiency is around 15% and the fluid operated at around 400 degrees C. Here is an image of the Ivanpah solar tower in the Mojave Desert. You can nicely see the concentric rings of mirrors and the bright tower. If you have ever been in the area of such a plant, these towers are really bright. If you think about CSP, there is no way to miss out Morocco, home of the world's largest concentrated solar power station. Here's an aerial image of the Ouar Sassate solar power station that is located just behind the high Atlas mountains that no cloud can pass in endless sunshine, but with some water from the mountains available. Good conditions for a solar thermal plant as besides sunshine also some cooling water is needed. The plant consists of four sections. NOR 1 is a 160 megawatt parabolic trough plant, NOR 2 is a 200 megawatt parabolic trough plant, NOR 3 a 150 megawatt solar tower, and finally NOR 4 a photovoltaics unit. The CSP plants are equipped with the molten salt storage, which is a mixture of sodium nitrate and potassium nitrate that is used as a thermal energy storage. This adds to the cost of the installation, but it can actually allow for a smaller turbine as it can carry over some heat from the peak at noon into the evening, allowing for a less fluctuating production. This effect can also be seen in the annual full load hours, which are the highest for the 7 hour molten salt storage compared to the 3 hour storage and the photovoltaics plant without any storage. From the published investment numbers, you can see that the investment cost of CSP plants are relatively high, more than 4000 euro per kilowatt, which is one reason why CSP is not widely spread thus far. Interestingly, the area requirements, as calculated in square kilometers per annual terawatt hour, are all in the same range, with slight advantages on the side of the photovoltaics. Here is more data from other plants, the famous Andasol plants in Spain or the Ashalim power station in the Negev desert in Israel, but both also had quite large investment costs. The advantage of CSP is in the flexibility to produce electricity at night with the thermal energy storage unit, and also the option to utilize the extra heat as process heat for nearby industrial operations. However, the area requirements are also quite special, so we will see how this technology can be improved further. Currently, photovoltaics seem to be the clear winners, especially with electric energy storage prices becoming cheaper and being installed to many of the new photovoltaic farms as well. We are almost through all the technologies. At the end, just some words to biomass. Basically, there are two ways of utilizing biomass as a fuel either the direct combustion and generation of steam, which can be used for heating and electricity production, or the production of biogas by fermentation and then subsequent combustion in a combined heat and electric power plant. Usually combustion engines are used for this purpose. Biogas contains around 60% methane, which is used as a fuel. The other components are mainly CO2. It should be noted that such power plants are usually rather small, which is less than 15 MW and only serve very local demand. Biogas plants are, for example, quite common in Germany. After having looked at many different methods of electricity generation, let's review the pros and cons and explore where in the world which mix of methods is used and try to understand why. For comparison, we are using this color scale from green to red or double plus to double minus. As a disclaimer, this ranking is just done for illustrative purposes. There is no scale behind what is double plus or plus. We will explain what was the rationale behind the choices, but please take this more as a rough relative comparison. Let's start with the regional availability. Since oil is easiest to be transported to even remote places, you can build an oil power plant almost everywhere. There are many countries that are 100% dependent on oil-fired power plants, for example some islands or some African countries. Coal, natural gas and nuclear also having a good availability, as these plants are rather compact and fuels can be transported. It doesn't make sense to transport biomass over long distance at all, so this would be rather poor. Also for geothermal and tidal power, only a few areas in the world have currently the potential for plants to be operated economically. And while photovoltaics can work almost everywhere, also on rooftops in cities in Europe, the solar thermal plants have much higher requirements on the location. 
Hydropower also got a minus. It is globally widespread, but you definitely need a river. And as it is a rather old technology, simply a lot of good spots have already been exploited. Next item is the temporal availability. Double plus means these power plants can be freely controlled to follow the demand and also without any seasonal limitations. Hydropower is very good in terms of short-term availability and the control, but can have seasonal limitations due to variations in precipitation. Tidal power, on the other hand, is constant over the seasons, but cannot deliver uninterrupted power during the day. Wind power and photovoltaics are suffering most from all kinds of fluctuations, daily, weekly, seasonal. Solar thermal is a bit better due to the use of thermal storage and maybe the fact that they are not built in areas with a lot of seasonal impact. In terms of land use, one should mention the utility scale solar farms that are using quite a large area and dual use with agriculture is an option that is currently explored. Wind power usually is sitting on top of agricultural land. Hydropower of course depends whether we are talking about the creation of a huge water reservoir or not. The next items are environmental and health impact and risks and here we are looking into the vicinity of the plants. In principle if you look at the stable operation of the plants these are mostly green. Assuming of course that proper filters are installed and in operation for example in coal fired power plants. However, there are of course some more issues to be taken into account when considering the coal mining, oil and gas extraction. Also the biomass specific agriculture of energy plants is associated with disadvantages for the environment. Nuclear power plants are strictly controlled and not affecting the local surrounding at all unless there is an accident. Two big ones happened already in Chernobyl and Fukushima. And big efforts are still being needed to contain the reactivity in these areas. Geothermal is also not double plus risks associated with toxic side products being pumped out from the deep. The drilling operations and water injections has of course impact on the environment and can even lead to local earthquakes. But also the renewable energy plants have some sort of environmental impact, usually on animals. The only technology that seems to be mostly unproblematic in operation is photovoltaics. Related to the environmental impact are the CO2 emissions. As mentioned, we are looking only in the process of electricity generation itself. While coal and oil are worse in this respect, natural gas is better, but still high compared to the possibility of zero or almost zero. Burning biomass obviously generates CO2, although the CO2 is often not counted. When a technology is dispatchable, this means it can follow the grid load easily. Here in principle all technologies are dispatchable with gas and hydro being the easiest and fastest to follow the demand. Coal and nuclear is possible but clearly not preferred economically. The other renewables are usually given priority in the grid since energy would be wasted otherwise. Then maybe the most important metrics, the electricity production cost. We have seen that oil is the worst for most cases. For most technologies it depends of course how cheap the local fuel and renewable resources are. Lowest costs seem to be currently achieved for gas and photovoltaics. For future developments a look into the cost down potential is important too. While for coal and oil the cost down potential is rather negative in the light of increasing costs for CO2 emissions. Hydropower is also an old technology with already high efficiency, so not clear how this can be even be cheaper in the future. For the newer renewable technologies, there seems to be a continuous drop in installation cost, efficiency improvements and further economy of scale, especially for the sunlight based ones. So is there one technology that has green in everything? No, there are always pros and cons. And that's why we observe a mix of technologies with huge regional differences. Let's have a closer look into this. Here is the world's electricity production mix. Shout out to ourworldindata.org for their excellent work on providing these datasets and beautiful interactive charts for free. As of today, most of the electricity is produced by coal, gas and hydropower on a respectable third place. Nuclear power is around 10%, oil power as mentioned only interesting in a few places due to generally the highest cost. Solar and other renewables are still small. If you look at the development over the last 20 years, we can see that electricity production has steadily increased around 2.5% every year. Strongest additions coming from coal, gas and renewables. In the chart 
showing the relative share, we can see that nuclear, oil and coal are currently on the way down, gas still being on the rise, but especially in the last year, wind and solar are taking off. If you look at the absolute changes from 2018 to 2019, then this trend is clearly visible, reducing more than 260 terawatt hour of coal, and the increase in wind and solar is really remarkable. Here's the situation in the United States. Electricity production was only slightly growing during the last 20 years. Since around 2008, the US has started to transform from a coal-dominant electricity producer to a gas-dominant one. The reason is an economic one, as this change goes hand in hand with the shale gas boom that led to a strong increase in local gas production, resulting in lower price levels. While nuclear and hydro are pretty much constant, the steady increase in wind and solar is clearly visible over the last years, but still on a low level compared to the enormous potentials that we have seen on the maps. On the other side, China shows a very different picture. The total electricity production has increased from around 1000 to over 7000 terawatt hours in the last 20 years, making it the largest electricity producer in the world. The growth came mainly from coal and hydropower, simply as these are the dominant and abundant resources in China. At least in the last 10 years, the share of coal has been reduced from 80% to around 60%, with wind and solar on the rise. Here is another interesting country, Japan. First of all, the overall electricity production is slightly reduced over the last years. Japan is an island with almost no significant own energy resources. In the last century, some undersea coal mines were in operation, but they became uneconomic already more than 50 years ago. If you ever make it to Nagasaki, you can visit Gunkanjima, an abandoned underwater mining city island, a very interesting place, maybe one of the technologically most advanced places 100 years ago. But as of today, all of the fuels have to be brought in by marine vessels. Until 2010, this was a mix of coal, gas, oil and nuclear. Around 7% is hydropower from more than 1000 dams and hydropower plants. Japan is full of beautiful mountains and has plenty of rain, but due to its small area, not many real big rivers can be formed. In 2011, after the Fukushima disaster, Nuclear power was basically fully shut down and mainly replaced by LNG. During the last years, solar energy sees a steep increase with government subsidies kicking in, whereas wind power staying rather small. We are not fully sure why this is, but it is very likely that in this densely populated country, there is almost no place left that is on the one hand accessible and where there are no people living close by that would be not annoyed by wind turbines in their proximity. South Korea is practically also an island, with almost all energy resources coming in by marine vessel. We see the typical mix like in Japan, coal, gas and nuclear with the strongest growth in LNG over the last years. In contrast to Japan, no efforts have been made to reduce nuclear power yet. Russia has plenty of energy resources, especially gas and coal, but also almost 20% coming from hydropower. The relative distribution is very stable, with slight growth happening over the last 20 years. Europe has a very special situation, with little fossil fuel resources and no strong overall growth in electricity production, the energy mix is becoming highly diversified in the recent years. Especially wind energy is on the rise, with already at more than 10% overall in Europe. Let's look at some of the countries in more detail. We have seen that the UK has a huge potential for wind energy, and indeed it is already the second most popular electricity generation method. Interesting also that basically coal energy has become almost obsolete over the last five years. A natural gas is the main method that is used to compensate for the wind power fluctuations. Germany is a similar case to the UK with strong subsidies in place. Renewables have seen strong growth over the last years, with especially nuclear energy and recently also coal seeing a strong decline. Here is a similar chart showing also the share of hard coal and lignite separately. 
Especially the hard coal is on the steepest decline over the last years, and in the coal section we have seen what this meant for the productivity of the plants. In the lockdown affected year 2020, 51% of electricity in Germany was produced by renewable energy. This is an interesting chart as it shows the installed capacity in Germany. Although the energy production is relatively constant, capacity has almost doubled in the last years. This shows on the one hand the annual full load hours being quite different. For example, one gigawatt of nuclear delivers around seven times more energy than one gigawatt of solar. But it also shows that not so many power plants, especially coal power plants, have been decommissioned yet, leading to a lot of idle capacity. Here is a weekly production chart of 2019 showing the seasonal flow. Typically there is more sun in summer than in winter, but there is also less wind in summer. Water and biomass are running through constantly over the year, and there is a tendency that a bit more fossil fuel energy is used in the winter time than in the summer time. Some weeks are so rich in wind speed that even the lignite plants have to be reduced. This diagram is showing the power with good time resolution in Germany. You can see the interplay of daily, weekly, irregular and regular variations. The black curve is the load, which can differ from the power generation. Actually, the European electricity grids are interconnected and there is a constant electricity trade happening across borders matching supply and demand. This chart shows the situation in January of 2020. In July, you see the strong patterns from solar actually nicely matching with the load. Of course, sometimes you have situations like here, where there is a weekend, low demand, but just too much wind around and these are the time when electricity prices actually become negative. What we have not mentioned thus far is the use of pumped hydro as an energy storage opportunity. In Germany pumped hydro plants usually produce during the morning and evening hours. There are some areas in the world in which electricity is produced even today with low CO2 emissions. And this is realized with different patterns. A prominent country is Brazil that is nowadays having access to almost 65% of hydropower. Another interesting pattern is in France with around 70% nuclear and less than 10% based on fossil fuels. Both of these patterns work of course rather easily since the temporal availability of both methods is high. But how far can we go using only wind? Denmark, home of Vestas, is a prototypical country with more than 50% coming from wind energy, 20% from biomass and the rest mainly from coal. It will be interesting to see how much further they can go with wind. Of course, we need to keep in mind that Denmark is not an island and is exporting also a lot of electricity to neighboring countries. Finally, with the United Arab Emirates, a country that has the potential to become the solar hub of the future. Thus far, not so much to see. Currently, 100% gas, potentially a good method to counter the day-night fluctuations of solar. However, they are going a bit in another direction, putting into place a 5.4 gigawatt nuclear power plant that has recently started its operation in the first unit. Let's see how it will play out in the future. Thank you for watching this video. If you like the content and want to support us in growing this channel, please kindly share this video. Hit the like button, subscribe to our channel and hopefully not miss any future videos. We highly appreciate your insights, questions or feedback. Please leave those in the comments. We invite you to connect on Twitter or Instagram or by email.